within days after Justice Jackson was appointed U.S. Chief of Counsel, he got the War Department to send a message to England to say that he wished Alfred Taylor to be returned to the United States directly. Uh, at that time, Alfred Taylor had been serving with a, a joint British-American intelligence group in Bletchley. But a week or two after he had returned to the United States, he wrote a memorandum, of which I have a copy. It's called An Approach to the Preparation of the Prosecution of Axis Criminality. This memorandum he wrote for Justice Jackson, and it had its influence upon some of the writings of Justice Jackson uh, shortly thereafter, if you were to compare some of the phrases. After the, after the trial got underway, Justice Jackson decided rather promptly, if he hadn't even before the trial started, that if there were to be subsequent trials, he wanted Telford Taylor to be his successor. Um, some of you will remember that during the first trial, uh, Telford Taylor made the presentation in the case against the general staff and high command case. I think that there was no presentation that was made in that first trial uh, against any organization which uh, equaled that presentation. Two months after that presentation, Justice Jackson named Colonel Taylor as Deputy Chief Counsel and he formally assigned him the responsibility for organizing and planning the prosecution of further war crimes trials. Colonel Taylor was promoted to be a Brigadier General, and shortly, within days after the IMT trial, the commander of the U.S. military forces in the European theater named him to be the U.S. Chief of Counsel for War Crimes. General Taylor served in that capacity for nearly three years. The complexity of the task of managing the prosecution staff at Nuremberg can hardly be comprehended by persons who are not there. This is partly indicated, I think, if you just think of some of the things which had to be managed and which had to be uh, coordinated together. There was an evidence division, an interrogation branch, a document control branch, uh, the language division overall, a personnel division, a central library, a cafeteria division. <laughs> then there were these the various trial groups, the SS division, the military division, the ministries division, the economics division, and then people who had worked in these general areas were split off to work on the various trial teams for each of the 12 cases. Uh, toward the end, he established a publications division, and uh, uh, I should have mentioned also that there was, of course, a public relations branch at uh, the trial. All of these branches with their many functions contributed greatly to the legacy of Nuremberg. And that legacy depended a great deal upon the wisdom, the vision, the organizational capacity, and the eloquence of Telford Taylor. Speaking, speaking of his capacity for expression, I will not quote some of the many things which are really quotable. But in several stages of the trial, the work which the rest of us had put together in one way or another in terms of masses of documents, partial briefs, partial memorandum, were pulled together by Telford, and he drafted the indictments in 12 different cases. In 12 different cases, he also drafted the opening statements 
which received a lot of attention and which drew the attention of each of the tribunals to the main theory and design and concept that the prosecution had in mind. Then in drafting the closing statements in those 12 cases, Alfred Taylor left deep marks upon the minds of the judges who were about to consider their judgments. I want to make a digression to say that during the first trial, during the IMT trial, there were no women who made a presentation to the International Tribunal, either from the American delegation, from the British delegation, from the French delegation, or from the Soviet delegation. But in the 12 subsequent trials, Delford Taylor saw that there were a number of women and legal attorneys in staff positions and in appearing before most of the tribunals. In making this statement about the man who was my boss for nearly three years. I feel very moved, and I'm delighted that we have Telford Taylor here tonight. Telford, would you please just stand? I think you have uh, a project that you'd like to put before us. Unless you want to use that at the end when you get through with all these things. You want it at the end or you want it now? No. Okay. After these moving tributes, it's very difficult to uh, come back to Monday and work. Especially if I get tangled up in this microphone, I'll never get out of here. <laughs> uh, we'll try. Um, some of you who were here five years ago will recall that uh, we passed a resolution at that time wanting to express the feeling of the Nuremberg reunion on March 23rd, 1991, that the crimes which were going on in the world at that time should be acted upon. And our resolution at that time urged the United Nations and the United States and the coalition partners to take appropriate action to investigate, indict, prosecute, and punish those Iraqi nationals who had planned and prosecuted aggressive war against Kuwait or committed war crimes or crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, that advice, as we know, was not followed. Those who committed those crimes walked away feeling that they could continue to commit such crimes with impunity. The price was paid by the mass rapes in Yugoslavia of thousands of women, the ethnic cleansing which carried on, the crimes in Rwanda thereafter. And so it behooved some of us to urge again that this group speak as a whole in calling again for a more rational rule of law and there was a small committee set up under the direction of Drexel Sprecher, Henry King, Bell Mayer, and we put together two resolutions for your attention. The resolutions are in your packets. Some of you, I hope, have read them. Uh, since Mr. Sprecher has given us all of five minutes to dispose of these minor matters. Uh, we won't have time, unfortunately, to discuss them again in any detail. I'll outline them for you. Those of you who feel that you would have said it much better, and I'm sure there are many of you who feel that way or might feel that way if you read them, since we are a democratic society, you're at liberty to file a dissenting opinion <laughs> within 
whatever you think is appropriate of the cause of war and peace. The first resolution is one which calls for a permanent international criminal court. That is an item which is not obscure. It is now on the agenda of the United Nations. On Monday at 9 o'clock in the morning, I will be meeting at the United Nations with many people, including a preparatory committee, uh, which is instructed to draft the statutes for a permanent international criminal court. Our resolution appeals to all the nations to honor and respect the principles of law espoused at Nuremberg by creating a permanent international criminal court to try all those who commit aggression, war crimes, genocide, or other crimes against humanity. As Telford Taylor pointed out in his fine book, Anatomy of the Nuremberg Trials, law is not a one-way street. We have to have a court which will apply the law equitably to all, including all of the Nuremberg crimes. You heard the eloquent and moving statement by Whitney Harris citing Justice Jackson that aggression was the most important of all crimes. Some of you will be surprised and disappointed to know that on Monday, the representative of the United States is expected to take a stand on that issue and suggest that aggression be dropped from the jurisdiction of the proposed permanent international criminal court. The reasons given are that there is no clear definition of aggression, which is not true, uh, that uh, it's too complicated, that it will delay matters, that it can be dealt with later, that only states can commit aggression and not individuals, absolutely contrary to the finding of the international tribunals, and that, as of this minute, is still the position of the United States. Some of us have taken action to try to persuade the president that he is being repudiated by his own staff because he promised all of us at a meeting in Connecticut that he would fully support the principles of Nuremberg, that it was a, an obligation to the future. So this resolution appeals to the president and the Congress to assume a leadership role in creating a permanent international criminal court by consolidating these existing ad hoc tribunals and espousing creating a permanent court to try all those who commit aggression, war crimes, genocide, or other crimes against humanity. We will pass on these at the end. The second resolution is a broad one. It's to strengthen the United Nations. At the time we were busy at Nuremberg, they were busy at San Francisco, growing up the charter for the United Nations to build the other attributes needed for a more peaceful world. All we have asked for in this resolution is that the United States honor the charter of the United Nations, which they have failed to do. This was the document, which was the answer to the 40 million people who had died in World War II trying to create a more peaceful world. It is a legally binding treaty approved and ratified by two-thirds of the Senate of the United States, accepted by all the member states, and then in many of its essential requirements, ignored. And so we call upon the Security Council and the other nations, members of the United Nations, to honor the principles of the Charter, including the payment of dues by the United States, which is a legal obligation, to enforce the law as promised in the Charter. And in this final paragraph, it resolves to work for a world order based on law rather than war, wherein differences can be settled legally and not lethally. We call upon all nations and peoples to join with us in honoring with determination and deed the legal and moral obligations enshrined in the judgments of the Nuremberg Tribunals and the United Nations Charter. We reaffirm our faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and the need to establish conditions under which justice and respect for international law can be maintained. Only in so doing can we finally move toward a world in which the American dream of liberty and justice for all 
can become a reality. If you agree with that, all those in favor, both those resolutions, please say aye. Aye. Those who oppose, please remain quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I think the decision is that it is affirmed by affirmation, and I thank you all, and I hope it will have greater weight than the last resolution. Thank you very much. from this morning. This is a very great honor for me to present these awards, and this is not a perfunctory remark. Our first honoree is, of course, General Taylor. Certificate of Appreciation. <clears throat> Certificate of Appreciation from the surviving staff at the Nuremberg Trials presented to Trent Telford Taylor, Associate Trial Counsel, IMT, Chief of Counsel, Subsequent Proceedings, for his vision, his leadership, his extraordinary eloquence, his writings, and for his dedication to human rights, the perpetuation of the Nuremberg Principles, and the rule of international law. Awarded at Washington, D.C., <clears throat> March 23, 1996, Drexel A. Strecker, Chairman, Third Reunion Committee. this morning, but Mr. Rambler, you must have been a stowaway on that ark. <laughs> <clears throat> Our next honoree is Professor Whitney R. Harris, Assistant Trial Counsel, IMT. Mr. Harris, could I impose on you to come up again? <laughs> distinguished service as a prosecutor at the first Nuremberg trial, his authorship of Tyranny on Trial, The Evidence in Nuremberg, and his other significant contributions to international law, human rights, and the establishment of a permanent international criminal court. Honoree is Charles A. Horsky, who 
cannot be with us tonight. But I would like to read his citation. Charles A. Horsky, for his important liaison work in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> as the representative of the United States Chief Counsel, IMT, for supervising the editing of the documentary evidence presented by the American and British prosecutions at the IMT, published in the 11 volumes titled Nazi Conspiracy and Aggression, and as special counsel at the last trial held in Nuremberg, USA against von Weizsäcker et al. And it's signed by Drax, and Drax, would you be kind enough to take this to Charles? Now we get to subsequent proceedings. And this certificate of appreciation goes to Drexel A. Sprecher. <laughs> Assistant Trial Counsel, IMT. Deputy Chief Counsel, subsequent proceedings. Editor-in-Chief, Trials of War Criminals Before the Nuremberg Military Tribunals. That's the green books. And this is presented to Drex for his tireless advocacy of the Nuremberg principles over the past 50 years, for being a unifying and stimulating force among the Nuremberg prosecutors and staff, and for his, ex <clears throat> so sorry, and for his extraordinary accomplishments in editing and publishing the official publication of the 12 trials subsequent to the IMT, thereby perpetuating an irreputable history of the crimes of the Third Reich. to stand beside me while I read that. Ben Ferrans, will you please come up? <laughs> Despite what you did to me this morning. <laughs> honoring Benjamin B. Ferenz for his unique accomplishments, Cohen, as chief counsel of the Einsatz Group in case, as architect and director of the Jewish Successor Restitution Organization, and for his unswerving dedication over the past 50 years to the cause of world peace, as expressed in his epochal volumes, Defining International Aggression, <laughs> An International Criminal Court, Global Survival, and other books, awarded at Washington, D.C., March 23, 1996, Drexel A. Sprecher, Chairman, Third Reunion. <laughs> Our 
next honoree is Professor Henry T. King, Jr., Trial Counsel, USA, against Milk. Henry? <laughs> Lawyer, Professor of International Law, President of the United World Federalists, Cleveland Chapter, Chairman of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association and other influential bodies, a tireless advocate of a permanent international criminal court and the rule of law. <laughs> this is a very important honoree. This is presented to Walter Rockler, trial counsel USA against Von Weizsäcker et al. for his dedication to Nuremberg, to public service and his invigoration of the Justice Department's <coughs> search for Nazi war criminals as first director of the Office of Special Investigations. Walter, where are you? Yes, I'm so sorry. I got a call from the BBC. I'm sorry I didn't realize when he went out to make it, so... I'll be glad to read it a few minutes later. I'll go on all night, Virginia. <laughs> Is Mr. Rosenbaum here from the Department of Justice? Eva, you can stay there. Okay. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to tell you, you spoke about your heroes today, and I too regard these people as heroes, but I have heroines too. <laughs> This award goes to one of my heroines, Virginia L. Sprecher. Virginia for inter alia <laughs> handling the backbreaking logistics involved in the registration, housing, feeding, and comfort of the participants in the Nuremberg reunions. And this is awarded at Washington, D.C., March 23, by your good husband. <laughs> a phrase far from least is Elizabeth spelt with an S not a Z Stuart Hardy Bobby where are you Bobby where's Bobby Hardy I'll read her award anyway for tracking down worldwide the participants in the trials and compiling for our three reunions 
directories of the judges, prosecutors, and staff. Dred Filet Sprecher, Chairman, Third Reunion Office. Has Walter Rockler come back yet? No, he's on the phone with the BBC. <laughs> well, Julia can it. I'm sorry, but I will hold this till Walter comes back. We won't be here. We won't be here. I will mail it to him. His daughter. His daughter's here. His daughter. Oh, good, Julia. Is Julia here? Yeah. And thank you all for being so patient. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to adjourn, say farewell at this 50th anniversary and to terminate the third uh, Nuremberg reunion, the third one we've held in Washington, D.C. Does anybody have any last minute essential remarks? <laughs> if not, farewell to you all. Thanks for coming.